Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, for those who are watching this online, let me just, and you've never been to Mises U, let me just explain what Mises U is about. I have this slide up here. The middle one uh, has the Jedi, and so some young man comes up to me beforehand. He says, what do you got Jedi up there for? And I said, I don't know, private security. They look cool, Liam Neeson. I mean, that's kind of an explanation right there. And he said, oh, but in episode one, it says the Chancellor dispatched the Jedi. And in episode three, Obi-Wan says they're sworn to uphold the Republic. So clearly, you know, this has no business in an anarchist talk. So at that point, I pulled the fire alarm and just left. But the, the point is, these are the sorts of doctrinal issues you get into at Mises U. And if you're going to come lecture here ever, just be ready that the kids are sharp. All right, so what am I talking about today? The market for security. Uh, this is... I think one of the most important things for a anarcho-capitalist, a libertarian in the Rothbardian tradition to deal with, uh, some people, let me, just, let me just justify why we spend time on this, because some people will say, who, who are minarchists, meaning they believe in a, a very minimal state, like the night watchman state, that, oh, come on, there should be a government that defends property and maybe administers uh, very general laws, but that's all that it does. But that's an important thing, or at least a lot of people believe that's what the government should be doing. So why are you Rothbardians over there in the corner, you know, calling them a bunch of statists and stuff and just raising a hassle? Right now, the state is so big, we got a global empire in the United States blowing kids up with drones. Can't we focus on rolling that back first, and then we'll deal with these little doctrinal issues once we have a minimal state 20 years from now? And that, that's the kind of argument we get a lot. And I think the, the answer is... Uh, well, first of all, this is more fun, right, than talking about cutting back Social Security by 16% by fiscal years 2016. That's kind of boring. You're talking about Obi-Wan and how could we hire him. That's much more fun. But beyond that, it's that uh, we have, as Rothbardian libertarians, there's a whole host of moral arguments for the illegitimacy of the state. And incidentally, in this talk, I'm going to be using terms like state and government interchangeably just because it's kind of a casual talk and I'm focusing more on applications. So theoretically, people might make distinctions between those terms. So what I mean when I refer to the state or government is an institution of organized violence that claims to be the sole arbiter of who can legitimately use violence in that region. And on top of this, so it can delegate that authority to people, but it claims that ultimately this institution is the one that decides who can use violence and who can't. And that, moreover, it derives its funding uh, involuntarily in the sense that even if there are people who have broken no rules according to the state itself, if they don't want to give money to it to help it enforce those rules, then the state says, well, then, oop, that's also a rule that you just broke. You have to be, give us money, and we, and we determine how much it is you know, through procedures. But that's what I mean by the state or government in, in this context. Okay, so um, there are lots of moral arguments that can be deployed against that sort of institution. You're just saying, in general, hey, aren't monopolies bad? Or uh, isn't it wrong to take someone's property against his will? I mean, if we just had a bunch of neighbors and 51% of them thought, hey, there's this poor guy down the street. Why don't we all raise money and, and get him a turkey dinner for Thanksgiving? And then some cranky guy down the street says, no, I don't like that guy. I don't want to give him money. Nobody in his right mind would say you were allowed to break in that guy's door and go take $20 from him because it's the right thing to do and it's helping poor people eat. And so therefore we're allowed to do that. N nobody would say that, but yet that's what you know, the Rothbardian thinks taxation is. So in, there's really no good argument against this. I mean, there are people who have arguments for why the state should exist in a moral sense, but I think the average person, the simple reason is always, well, come on, we need to have it otherwise those crafty Canadians would have invaded us and taken us over, right? And so that's why we need to have, and then there's one infiltrator right here in the front row, so just everyone be careful. Don't, don't tell her what the launch codes are, um, right? So th that's, that's the, the trump card they always have, that you know, we don't even need to deal with your moral issues because we'd all be dead or we'd all be speaking German or whatever the cliche is uh, if we didn't have a state or you know, there'd be a bunch of rapists running around or that kind of thing. So that's the... That's why I think it's important to go over this topic is to show that, no, the free market works here too. And then also, since this is such a, you know, the hardest case, if you can show somebody why privatizing judicial and military defense services 
wouldn't be the catastrophe that people assume because this has issues of public goods and externalities and all these things that uh, a mainstream economist will bring up to justify government intervention in other areas. And here, this isn't some minor issue about like, oh my gosh, with all these sneaker companies, there's inefficiency and shouldn't we have government intervention or there's too many breakfast cereals? You know, these are things the interventions used to worry about. I'm not, those aren't straw men like in the 60s. Those were things to show how awful the market was. Here, it's life or death. And it's, you know, making sure that an axe murderer doesn't break down your door. So if we can show people that the market would work well here, then that's, that's pretty much showing them that the market really works in general. So that's why it's important, I think, to, for us to hash out these issues, even though in some sense this, this kind of isn't relevant, that this isn't even going to be an issue that we need the majority to care about for a long time uh, in, the, in the sense that a lot of people mean. Okay, one, uh, another large caveat to explain the framing of this lecture, I personally call myself a pacifist, right? So, uh, and, and people say, what do you mean by that? You know, with, if aliens were going to invade and you had to go punch Paul Krugman in the shin uh, or else, <laughs> you know... 16,000 Catholics get vaporized, what would you do? I, I would probably punch him in the shin, all right? But then I would apologize and buy his book, all right? So that's, so, you know, what do I mean? I'm just saying, in general, I think that there are, that in general, uh, you, violence is overrated, whether it's private violence or government violence, that just as, you know, going through the reasons for how you can say, you know, I'm not sure the U.S. government should have gone into World War II when you can start listing reasons, by the same token, I could come up with things saying, you know, just because that, that uh, armed robber came in and tried to steal money from your bank, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, using, shooting him was the right thing to do. Like, that sends a message to the community that guns are okay, and like, it would have been better if we could have used nets, or even better, da 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 da, -da you know, or we'll go ahead and let him take the money and then have contracts with people so that the electric company shuts off the power to his house until he gives the money. But, you know, things like that, I'm saying, I think in general using violence should be shunned and that even a lot of libertarians uh, believe that violence is really great when used under these circumstances. And I want to say, no, actually, I think it's, it's not great in those circumstances either. Right? But th those are my personal views. That doesn't have anything to do with libertarian rights theory per se. And so I'm not, there's no contradiction there. The analogy I'll give you in terms of what am I going to be doing in today's talk where I'm going to talk about the market for security I could give a, a lecture saying what would the free market in uh, recreational drugs look like, and we all know that that would mean, therefore, I'm for you out going out and using heroin, right? And so, I'm not, by the way, just to make sure there's no ambiguity on that point, right? But I would be talking, to, but clearly there are some people who don't think it's immoral, or if they do feel guilty about it, they don't care because their addiction trumps that or whatever. Um, and so clearly, if the government totally legalized what are currently illicit drugs, there would be a booming market in heroin and cocaine and so forth, and we could talk as economists about the supply and demand, and what would happen to the price of heroin in that market, and would there be competition, and what would standards of quality do, blah, 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 what would happen to overdoses? And none of that would mean that I personally think it's moral to go do that stuff. So it's the same thing here with my particular religious views and so forth. I actually think in general, certainly if someone's breaking into my house and I shoot him and kill him, I'm going to feel awful about that and think I probably committed a sin or uh, acted immorally. But that's a separate thing from me as an economist analyzing a society very much like the current United States or other uh, so-called Western democratic nations and saying with the people and their value systems and the things they care about in these types of communities right now, if the government's monopoly were lifted on private providers of judicial rulings and defense services, what would that market look like? Okay, so that's, that's the way I'm framing this and reconciling what I'm going to say now with my own personal views of uh, the acceptable use of violence. Okay, the next uh, framing issue is for me to say, I actually think private defense, even though a lot of people believe, oh my gosh, that's the biggest stumbling block for pure libertarianism or, or anarcho-capitalism, a lot of people think, you know, to them it would just be the trump card of, oh, yeah, okay, well, you're going to privatize the military, or, yeah, I'd like to see what your theories do when Adolf Hitler's coming down the street, yeah, you know. But actually, private law is, is hard, right? That's the thing I think conceptually is difficult to imagine 
what would it even mean to have a rule of law and what would it mean to talk about property rights if there's not some default agency that gets to define all that stuff. That it, it's, that's really the, the hard part. To then, if you assume that you have that framework in place and that it's crystal clear in the community who the criminal is and who the rightful property owner is and when a law has been broken or when property rights have been violated, if, that's, if you've assumed that problem is solved, then it's child's play to say, could there be private uh, competitive suppliers of services to enforce that ex existing framework of law or those existing body of, of property rights? So uh, we'll, we'll see that later in the lecture, but I just want to, to clarify that that's why I'm going to spend more time talking about the, the legal aspects of this, because to, to me, that's, that's really the stumbling block. And once you solve that, the other stuff is just an application. It's kind of like, um, you know, if you're talking about privatizing the roads and somebody was really worried about wh what type of uh, material you were going to use for the surface of the road, and they thought that was the really complicated part, not, well, how do, the, what, how do you determine right of way and if some road over here thinks it should be on the right-hand side and, and, cars, and people should drive on the right-hand, but the guy over here thinks cars should drive on the left-hand, how do they coordinate? I mean, that's kind of the issue with road privatization. It's not real trivial d details about the, the type of concrete to use or wh whatever the asphalt to use in the surface. So that's, to me, it's the same thing here. The, defining the property rights without a state is hard, and then once you have that, protecting them or enforcing their protection is, is pretty simple. Uh, and the so as far as the the work on that, I'm going to give some recommendations at the end. But probably the classic work in a Rothbardian framework for the nature of private law would be uh, Rothbard's The Ethics of Liberty. And uh, but even here, I'm going to I'm not going to take that. Per se, I'm just gonna I'm gonna take a step back and say, whatever views people have about property rights and who owns what and what it's acceptable to do if somebody violates your property rights, take that as a given. And then, what would a free market in that sort of context look like? All right. So, uh, let me just make sure you know what I mean. It's it's not enough just to say this is what everybody owns, or in a just world, this is how property titles would be allocated. And, and Rothbard does talk about that in the Ethics of Liberty. We have theories about homesteading, and then how do you exchange titles to things, and, and what sort of things is it possible to exchange titles for? And that, that's an argument in libertarian theory, right? Like, can you sell yourself into slavery? That sort of thing. But beyond that, there's a whole other area of punishment theory. So given that we all agree on who justly owns what and what sort of things can be owned by their very nature, what now if somebody comes along and quite clearly in the eyes of the community breaks those rules and steals from someone or engages in you know, bodily aggression and that sense violates the property rights and self-ownership, what can that what can we do as the community to that person and not ourselves be criminals? And that's again a whole messy, fuzzy area where uh, even libertarians who are on board with everything else don't necessarily agree on that. Uh, so if if somebody comes up to me and punches me and, and blinds me in one eye, can I kill him? And uh, most libertarians would say, no, you can't. Um, the only reason you could is if it's in the middle of the fight and you're fearing for your life. And so in self-defense, to you know, stop the attack, you do that. Or even some people might say, no, no, it's not even that you have to fear for your life, but if a guy's coming at you with a letter opener or something, he's going for your eye, and you know he's not going to be able to kill you. Like, you can see there's other people in the bar or whatever, because you know you bring letter openers to the bar. That's what I do. Um, there's not too many bars that, that say, you know, no letter openers allowed, so I, I think I'm not violating any implicit contracts. Uh, you know, let, let's say you got some guy coming at you with that thing, and he's not that big, and there's plenty of other patrons standing around, and you know, okay, he's going to take out my eye, but then they're going to tackle him. A lot of people would say, you're still, if you happen to have a gun on you, you're allowed to kill the guy to save your eye. Okay, but what you're not allowed to do is he takes your eye or whatever, he gets apprehended, he gets hauled off, he gets convicted, and then the penalty is we hang him and to death. You know, that's most libertarians say, no, you can't do that because, he, yeah, he took out your eye, but you can't take his life for that. Okay, so that's the kind of thing uh, that, that people wonder about. Or does he have to pay your court costs too? 
well, oh, if he has to do that, well, can you just go and take the, court, the case to your brother-in-law who's a judge and have him charge a million dollars? You see what I'm saying? So it gets really complicated really fast, even if you can agree on what the, the default standard just property titles are. Right? So these are things that get fleshed out. And so books like The Ethics of Liberty have positive statements of what should be the norm and I'm saying in a free society, books like that would influence the rulings that judges would make. But what I'm talking about here is more the economic forces for how those decisions are made and, and the market for them. I'm not talking about what I think the rulings should be. Okay, so let's just work through a simple example. So let's say uh, you're in, you know, we're in this free society and somebody breaks into your house you come home, you, you see a guy breaking into your house, and he runs out the back door with your TV. All right, so what happens? So what I want to suggest is that there's, there's two separate things here, and that a lot of times we, we link them. And even in, in certain treatments, sometimes I think these things are linked and they shouldn't be, at least conceptually. That I think there is a, one whole separate area is judicial rulings and people giving statements as to what they think happened and what happened with property titles. And then a whole separate issue is, what do we do about it now that we've got this pending or this standing judgment that a crime has occurred or that somebody has violated a contract and that certain redresses do? And I think those in practice, but certainly conceptually, should be distinct things. Uh, not the least reason for which is that people might get scared if one company both renders judicial rulings and has guys with guns who then back them up, that that starts to look a little bit like a state, even if it's not theoretically, I think in practice, a, a free society would be suspicious about those things and that they would be distinct. And just in terms of uh, economies of scale and comparative advantage and other reasons, I don't see why those two agencies would be the same. Just like you wouldn't think in a free society, one company does your oil changes and also has all the bazookas. That would just seem odd. Like, why would that be the case? It could be. It wouldn't be a violation of libertarian rights if it were, but that seems like that would be an odd outcome. And by the same token, I don't see why the company that specializes in providing judicial opinions when there's allegations of TV theft would also have a division of uh, people with body armor and, and mace and assault rifles who then go out and get your TV back. That seems like those are different things. And why would, they, why would the same company have those two branches in it? Okay, so, so what happens? You, somebody, I, I, the scenario I described you, I come home, somebody's running out my back door with a TV. So I would say the, the first thing that you do is you go and you, and you want to have the community, you want to build a consensus in the community as to who you think did it. So let's say there's a guy down the street, this you know, punk kid, and he's always been stealing stuff from other neighbors, and I'm pretty sure, you know, the build of the person running out my back door, I'm pretty sure it was that kid. Like, I mean, I personally, I know it was that kid, all right? And uh, and we can make it me more or less confident as you want. I mean, suppose I literally saw his face. So I, I really, truly know it was that kid that did it. Uh, it's So in terms of libertarian theory, I would be justified if I go and get a bunch of my cousins and we go down and kick down the kid's door and take my TV back, right? And actually, according to Rothbard, we could take his TV also. So that would be fine. Like, I would not have violated anybody's rights. I can't go to my neighbors and put a gun in their heads and take up a collection so then I can hire my cousins to take the, the flight out to go do that, because then I would be aggressing against my neighbors to fund what otherwise would be a legitimate activity. But the point is, I have violated nobody's rights if I did that. But in practice, I wouldn't do that because my neighbors don't know that I know it was that kid, right? They would be concerned that, Bob, you and your tough cousins can't just go around kicking down people's doors. That's not a neighborly thing to do. What if you're wrong? It's not that we're saying that you're consciously stealing some kid's TV, but for all we know, you made a mistake. You know, it was dark when you came home and maybe you saw the back of his head and you know he's been stealing other stuff, and so maybe you just had this bias in your mind, you know, that kind of stuff. So we want to live in a society where we don't need to worry about people kicking down our own doors for similar mistakes. There has to be, we want to live in a society where there's rules in place to protect the so-called rights of the accused, that sort of thing. So there, it's, it's not so much 
that he has this either God-given or natural rights-given right to a fair trial by his peers or anything like that. It's just more pragmatically, I think, the way things would evolve, you would not be doing that. You wouldn't just go around doing vigilante activity. And if you want, if some of you are uncomfortable and think, oh, this sounds too wishy-washy, I want stuff spelled out, there could be rules in place where you, when you buy a house in a certain subdivision, the, the developer of that might have you sign covenants or whatever you want to call them, contractual agreements saying, if I ever think that somebody in the neighborhood has committed a crime against me or has violated a contract or whatever, I will submit the dispute to arbitration. I won't just take the matter into my own hands, right? So if you want, you know, the stuff can be spelled out formally so that it's not just pure custom and getting along with your neighbors, that it actually is. You would be violating contractual agreements. You would be an aggressor, not because of the grand nature of what you're doing, but because you had earlier agreed in this sort of scenario, I, I promise to do things this way, and that's how I'm going to handle it. Okay, so, so then what, what do you do? Would it work for you then to just call up, you know, to, 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 to say, hey, my wife was there too, and honey, what, who do you think stole the TV? And she says, that kid down the street. I said, there you go. Okay, let's go do it, guys. And then you get your cousin. No, because again, people would say, that's, that's not right. So what sort of thing would convince the community as to who the, the proper TV thief was and, and who should be punished, who should answer for this crime? It would be a judge, and that's what judges do. So there is a role for judges in a, in a free market. It's not that they need to be appointed by the state. And historically, we see examples of this. And, and currently, there's arbitrators. And uh, you know, if, if you're, you guys are relatively young, so you may not have seen this firsthand, but this happens all the time when people get divorced, even when certain companies have disputes. And they, they typically will settle it through arbitration, and then there'll be agreements where they'll sign and say, and therefore, you know, the, the weight of the state's law now backs up what the arbitrator said because we agree to it. And there's exceptions where if you think you didn't get treated fairly, you can sue in the state court. But the point is, in practice, there are plenty of arbitrators right now who render opinions on things and settle disputes more so than the government legal system. Not because everybody's a bunch of anarchists right now, but just because the, the government legal system is so expensive and so long. That if you're a company, you know, two companies have a dispute with each other, they can't afford both monetarily and in terms of time to, to have that thing in court for five years. They want to just settle it and know one way or the other what's the agreement so we can get on with our business. So they go to a private arbitration. So these private judges or arbitrators, how do they stay in business? They have to have a reputation for fairness. So I can't just go to some judge who is notorious for being hard on crime and that it just takes the faintest whiff of evidence for him to, to convict somebody, right? Because then my neighbors aren't going to be convinced. That's going to be like me asking my wife, did you think that kid did? And she'll say, yeah, if I just go to some judge and all I have to do is give my testimony. And he said, well, that's all I need to hear. You know, this, this good upstanding man in the community wouldn't lie about something like that. Clearly this kid's guilty. That wouldn't be enough. But what, what if I took it to a different judge and I had uh, video footage in my house? You know, I had a security camera and you saw the kid's face. Well, that would be pretty damning evidence. Or what if um, somehow we could, you know, there's a, a, a neutral agency that's very fair and uh, goes to his house and says, we're just collecting information for this, this decision. Can we look at the, uh, the serial number on that TV? Because your neighbor down the street, Murphy, alleges that you took his TV and he can have the documentation and show what the serial number is on his, his unit. Can we look at yours? And they couldn't just barge in. I mean, he could say no. But if he said no, that might be suspicious. If he said, sure, go ahead, and it's the wrong serial number, well, then that would be a pretty good defense for his part, right? So you see, there's all kinds of natural things you could think of for how would we determine this in reality that the legal system could adopt, right? There, there wouldn't have to be constitutionally laid out evidentiary rules and so forth. Would, the things that made sense could, could exist, and the, and the market would determine that in the sense that judges who used things that most of the people in the community thought, well, that's a sensible way to figure out who the, who the criminal is, those judges would, would rise in popularity, right? Because again, what I want to do, I want to get my TV back. I want to make sure my neighbors don't get suspicious of me. And so I, what I want is I want some objective third party to say I'm in the right here. And then we'll figure out what to do about it. 
And so that's what the judges would be doing. So what they would be selling is their opinion. And that sounds odd to people. So it would not be a, you know, a, this thing that has the force of law per se behind it. They would be giving their opinion. And, there, and we have that language now with judicial rulings. They'll say so-and-so wrote the majority opinion. And that's, you know, that's an interesting concept when you think about it. We don't have too much time to spend on this because I want to get to other stuff. But just taking that, if you never thought these things through, just to think about that and carry it forward, that's actually a very interesting idea that there's this, because the idea is the judges are grappling with this existing body of thought or these principles, and they're applying it in a specific instance, and they're giving their opinion as to what the law says on this case. And that's what they're doing. And that's why they could be overturned, because what happens there is some other judge says, I think that opinion was wrong. So it's not that the judges are creating the law out of thin air. It's not that they are the government or something. What they're doing is coming along, and they're very wise, and they're trained in the law, and they know more about it than anybody else in the community, and they're coming along saying, this is what I think the law says on this case, and that's all they do, and you're paying them for that. And, that, and how they stay in business is they have to have given such wise, uh, equitable rulings, judicious rulings, right? They want to be the fairest maiden in the land, so to speak. They do that because their whole service, what they're selling to you, is a fair judgment because you then want to be able to show that to the community and say, look, I got a fair judgment from this guy. So it's sort of like um, things, other areas like uh, grammar. People, the, the companies that write books, that grammar textbooks and things like that, or, or companies that publish dictionaries, they aren't defining the English language, right? It's not, so if Webster's comes out with his next edition and you go and look up the word UP up, and it says tending to go towards the ground, it's not that, oh my gosh, Webster just redefined what up means. Now up means down. And you just walk around, everyone has to do it. No, what would we do? We would say, that's stupid. They, they got it wrong. That's not what the word means. That's the wrong definition. They improperly codified it. All right. But also at the same time, it's, it's not that we can dispense with having dictionaries and grammar textbooks and uh, style manuals, and so that when you're editing a paper for your class, that you know, oh gee, am I supposed to use a semicolon here or a comma? I mean, you can go look that stuff up and see what what the rule is, even though those rules themselves are not set in stone. The, the way we talk now and write now, what's considered grammatical now, is not what was considered grammatical when William Shakespeare was writing. So things do change, but yet it's there is some rhyme and reason to it. There are rules in place, even though the rules themselves are not derived purely from our reason and they're set in stone once you deduce them. Okay, so I think studying language and how there are experts in language who codify things, but there could be disagreements, right? Some people think that uh, you can say certain things and that's fine, and other people say, no, no, you can't do that, and they disagree with each other, like even so-called experts in grammar will disagree on things. So that's the, the analog for, for judges disagreeing. All right, so back to this story. So you, you take your case to a wise scholar that the community recognizes as an expert in the law, and he renders his opinion. And he says, yep, that guy down the street is guilty, in my opinion. So now, once you have that in hand, and what you could do, of course, part of what the service would be this person, this judge, would say to the accused, come present defense, a defense. And he would go hire lawyers because not everyone's an expert in how the law works. And you see, there would still be lawyers who would advocate on your behalf, who know the system, will know, oh yeah, this judge. And you might say, well, what if he doesn't like that judge? What if he thinks, no, this guy Hoppe has it out for TV thieves, and he's you know, real itchy with his trigger finger, so to speak. He could say, the kid down the street could say, no, my lawyer suggests somebody else, like Roderick Long. He's a pushover, right? You really, if you're accused, you want to have Roderick Long be your judge. But the, and so we could go back and forth and we would settle on some, a judge that we can both agree on that this person's fair. So that's what I'm trying to get across to you guys is um, a typical objection is to say, wait a minute, there's, it's inconceivable. There can't be a voluntary judge because the defendant would just always say, no, 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 I don't like this judge. But that would start to look suspicious, right? And eventually, you would just say, okay, well, clearly this guy's stonewalling. I'll take it to a judge that most people in the community agree this person doesn't have it out for the accused. It's not like 
they have a personal grudge. I'll take some judge who doesn't even know this kid. And then, and, you know, it's not some guy whose father was killed when someone broke in and stole a TV when he was eight, and so he hates TV thieves, right? So you find somebody like that, and then he says the kid's guilty. That's a pretty good, so, so the point is, but the, if you're accused of something, you're going to want to go to court. You're going to want to present evidence in your defense if, you, if you're innocent. And so what I'm saying is you can vie for it, and the, the, you'll be able to reach agreement and find some arbitrator that you can both say, yeah, this guy's fair. So judges are not going to be able to stay in business if they consistently rule for the accused and they're always throwing things out and saying, no, I don't think there's sufficient evidence here because then plaintiffs would never go to that court or that judge. But on the other hand, if somebody's real hard-nosed, tough on law or tough on crime, that kind of person who's always ruling in favor of the plaintiff, then accused defendants won't agree to that person. So there will be a market vying process and you'll have judges that are considered fair. And again, if people think, oh, that's, that's impossible, that wouldn't happen in practice, but that's because people are thinking that there's no such thing as objective law. They think that it's just purely arbitrary and just whoever has the most guns gets their way. But if instead you think, no, there really is some reason involved and there are general principles determining who, uh, what the legal code should be and then what it says in this particular application, then you think there is a scope for true experts to arise. Just like uh, another analogy besides language might be mathematics, where in one sense, if you say, well, who, who are the leading mathematicians? Well, how does it get determined uh, who, who the world's experts in math are? And most of us don't really know that much about math. And so we would have to say, well, whoever's working at Harvard and MIT and whoever publishes in the top journals and whoever writes the textbooks that get adopted by most math professors, that's who the, the world's leading experts in math are. But if you see, think that through, you're basically delegating that. And so in theory, it could be the case there's just this crazy historical accident. A bunch of crazy people who are awful at math somehow got in charge of those you know, key positions in power, and now the editors of all the really prestigious math journals publish articles that are terrible, and that really there's all these brilliant mathematicians out there that can't get published. Right? See, if you, I'm kind of describing Austrian economics, if you think about it. <laughs> And that is really what we think's happened when we, you know, Austrians do think happen in, in economics, right? That, well, yeah, the reason we're not getting in top journals is because a bunch of Keynesians running those things or a bunch of neoclassical crazy guys. Okay, but with something like math, where most people think that is just objectively, there's you know, very little ambiguity on that. I mean, there's certain little areas where people wonder, does this make sense? Can you uh, have a proof by contradiction or not? Or is that a valid thing? To, okay, but in general, people know what math is and various branches of it, and they kind of agree on that, and they can agree, mathematicians can agree, take two mathematicians, who's the better mathematician? There, there's some sense of, well, no, this person's a genius, this person's just a rank-and-file guy who teaches undergrads, okay? So I'm saying that if you think law has some natural intrinsic meaning and that it makes sense to talk about what was just or what wasn't and what's legal and what's not, then it makes sense that these private individuals could discover the right ruling in certain cases and apply it. And that it would make sense the community could agree on somebody who is fair. It's not that all these judges would be infallible, but that there would be no reason to systematically think that they're biased. Uh, one last analogy would be professional sports. There are rules of the game, and yeah, on a particular thing, you know, some fan uh, might say, oh, my team got robbed, you know, back in the 87 World Series in game four, that was clearly a strike, and he called it a ball, that's crazy, and then my team lost. You could say that, but that's the point, is you have to go back to 1987. Whereas it's not like now people say, hey, do you think that the government makes fair rulings? And everyone's like, oh yeah, one time back in 87, I think a judge ruled the wrong way. You know, and that's you know, the one time that I can imagine the government did, said something wrong. No, it's like, yeah, last Tuesday they beat the heck out of some lady, kicked her in the face because she took a picture of him. You know, and it's, so I'm trying to get across that, and, and the reason for that discrepancy is not because professional sports has objective rules and human living doesn't. It's that, no, professional sports is run in a voluntary setting and the, the people making, you know, the officials in sports are hired privately and they're catering to consumers who are watching the game and want to see a fair game. So even if you're a Yankee fan, you actually wouldn't want to patronize a, a, a system, an organization that always had umpires who threw the game for the Yankees all the time. 
after a while, because then the other, you know, the fans of other teams would point that out to you. You want it to be that, no, your team legitimately beats them. Yeah, sure, it's because you have a lot of money and you have the biggest payroll and you can have all the, the heavy hitters and so forth. But the point is you don't want to actually be known as the team that always literally cheats. And that's why you win, because the whole system's rigged. OK, so it's just not profitable for professional baseball to have umpires who consistently throw the game to the biggest teams. OK, yeah, you can come up with cases or if there's a scandal. But that's the thing. When we talk about scandal in baseball, we go back to the Black Sox incident. If you want to come up with corruption in government, you don't have to go back to the early 1900s to come up with that one time that, remember that, when some judge took money and did something corruptly? Wow. You see what I'm saying? So the difference, again, is not because of baseball is easy and uh, crime is hard. It is that uh, it's the monopoly organization providing it. OK, so Hoppe gives his ruling. He says, yeah, that kid down the street, he did it. I'm pretty, you know, you've, you've shown me the surveillance footage. Uh, he, he gave his alibi that it was inconsistent um, and so forth. He said all these things, and, uh, and, and then he, he's refusing to let these other groups come in and just verify what the serial number on the TV is, or he, he let them come in and it had been scratched off, you know, that kind of stuff. So it really looks like this kid. So I, in my opinion, I'm saying that kid's guilty. You allow, then a lot of the kids say, hey, do you want to appeal that? And he, you know, if you want to take your case, if you think you were treated unfairly, and he goes, and he says, oh, yeah, I didn't do it. And so he has his lawyer, and they go around and shop it around, and all these other judges review the case and say, look, kid, you know, you can hire me to give a ruling, but I'm going to rule the same way. You know, so you'll be out 500 bucks or whatever because this is an open and shut case. You, it looks like you did it. Maybe you didn't do it, and I'm, it's too bad if you didn't. I feel bad for you if you're uh, just, you have the dumb luck that someone who looked just like you and you happen to scratch the serial number off your TV when you bought it last week at Best Buy. I don't know why you did that, but... <laughs> Uh, you know, sucks to be you, all right? So, and then he, so he knows he's in trouble. So now what happens, finally now, I don't call my cousins to come because the kids said, well, I'm just, you know, these, this judge is crazy. I'm getting set up here. This is, this is unfair. So now part of the, you know, the, the, the covenants with the Neighborhood Association or whatever might say, if it, there is a pending ruling you are, that someone says you stole their thing and you refuse to comply with the totally accepted, legitimate, uh, judge, judge's opinions and so forth, then you are agreeing that you're not going to resist if someone comes in and, and forcibly takes it back from you. And that's you're agreeing beforehand to these things. You know, so there could be stuff built in. And even if it's not, I would say that would just be that the community would realize in certain cases, okay, something's got to give here. I mean, there's this, this disagreement, and this guy has gone through all the procedures. He's shopped it around. He's allowed the kids to, pro to appeal the case and so forth, and all these other judges who we know from our experience are totally fair, have said, no, nah, it's an open and shut case, the kid took the TV, then at that point, I don't go to my cousins, I go to a professional whose job it is to enforce uh, <laughs> contract rulings, right? And so now, what does the, the Guido Holzman agency do? Do they go to the kid's house? Do they roll up with tanks? Do they send in tear gas canisters that then start on fire and they have nerve toxins that are banned in international warfare and end up killing the kid's whole family and then say, but we're doing it for the TVs, right? No, that's not what happens. That would be awful for business. He would not stay in business. He would, if he did that once, his company would go out of business. Nobody would ever take their, you know, this pending ruling and then take it to his agency to enforce that. They would take it to some other agency that didn't have such a horrible blemish on their, on their track record. Right, so what would he do? He wouldn't, I mean, I was exaggerating before, but he actually wouldn't break down the kid's door for a TV. That would be crazy. All right, that would be, so it would, um, if, if, if I thought the kid had kidnapped my daughter or something, was holding her, then they might break down the door. If they, you know what I'm saying? But for a TV, they probably would just because they would, they would be bad for business. It's not that big a deal. All right, it might, and it's true, I would have insurance that would have compensated me, so I'm not going to be out the TV and they would work these things out. But the point is, I'm just giving you the, the, the framework in which these things would happen. And so again, notice his agency, they would show up, they probably wouldn't even have guns. They would probably you know, have body armor on and things in case he's armed. And they might just wait the, the, the kid out and say, you know, come on out, give us the TV and we'll go, you know, we can do this the hard way or the easy way. And you know, they might start playing David Gordon lectures and beaming them into the kid's house until he says, no, all right, here's the TV. You know, <laughs> there's all kinds of things they could do but they would not probably send in uh, 
toxic gas that would kill an infant if an infant happened to be in the premises. That would just be really bad for business. Among all the, I mean, it might be illegal also, but the point is, even if it weren't, if you're saying, come on, you're begging the question, we're trying to determine what is legal and what isn't, it doesn't even matter whether they had the right to do that. That would be a silly thing for them to do. In the same token, if you're just a, a, a store and you're hiring private security, like you're a convenience store and you've been getting victimized by shoplifting, and so you bring in some heavy muscle, you're, you're not going to want it to be the case that if some teenage kid swipes a candy bar, that this huge guy tackles him and breaks his arm while bringing him into custody. That's not good for business. Whether, you know, so it's not that you know, if the kid's family brings a lawsuit against you and the judges throw it out and say, no, we got you on surveillance, you were doing that, and you know, the, the way the law applies, technically they're allowed to use force to bring you under if you're stealing. If you're in the act of stealing, they can do that. To if they, even if that's what the law said, that's just not good for business. You don't need to do it. And so you would, even though technically you wouldn't have had a legal ruling against you, you're going to fire that security company because there's going to be a competitor that says, we will make sure your candy bars are okay, sir, and we won't break kids' arms while doing it. So you're not going to have you know, this awful publicity and have the community think that you hire you know, racist security guards or something. Right? So that's the kind of thing that he's, in practice, you wouldn't have anything in the same zip code as what the government uh, agents do now enforcing the law. Okay. Would there be prisons in a free society? Well, so here, um, this is something, I haven't heard anybody tell me I'm right or wrong on this. So I just want to be clear. I think up till now, I've, stuff I've been saying is pretty much on the reservation. Here, this is stuff that I've come up with, and I don't know, uh, maybe in the Q&A or something, if Roderick wants to jump in and say whether this is standard stuff or if this is something. But anyway, this is the way I think about it. So um, what you'll have... In practice, is or so I've talked about TV. Or so, what, what a crazy case! You know, some guys literally going around with an axe chopping people up. Okay, it's a bit of a problem. So a little bit awkward, as Doctor Evil would say. All right, so what do you do about that? So people are going around bringing cases to judges. It, it's an emergency. You know, like the guy gets paged at two o'clock in the morning. Get up! There's an axe murder runner up. So they make a quick ruling. You know, they see the surveillance footage. They see the guy. You know, he's missing his arm and says, "Yeah, he's swung an axe at me." Okay, they see the guy walking down the street, not on the guy's arm, and they're like, I think that's probably, guy's probably guilty. All right, so what do they, so they rule, so it's crystal clear. There's no doubt that this guy's an ax murderer, so now what happens? Well, you're allowed, even without talking about what does the law give us the right to do, everyone's a property owner, so whoever owns that street, whether it's a corporation or whether it's a, 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 so, a neighborhood association or whatever, they can certainly say to that person, you know what, we don't like, convicted ax murderers walking around on our sidewalk, so get off. And it was, so it's not so much, you know, we don't have to say, do they have the right to go shoot him in the head? Maybe they do, maybe they don't, but I'm saying it, it wouldn't even come to that. They can certainly say, this is our property, we don't want you here, you're not welcome because you're a convicted ax murderer and you're spilling blood all over the place. We're going to have to clean that up, get, get off my property. And the thing is, everybody can say that, right? There's no such thing as public land in this community we're envisioning, every, every parcel of land is privately held by somebody or some organization, and presumably most people are going to agree if some guy is literally a convicted serial killer and he's roaming around, I don't want him on my property, and so I'm saying get off. So, and what you can do, of course, you're allowed to say to someone, get off my property, and if they say no, you can forcibly eject them. And again, in terms of libertarian theory, we can come up with what are you allowed to do if I say to some kids that are playing football on my front lawn, get off, and they say no, I probably can't go shoot them in the head you know, in the next two minutes. I probably have to let things escalate a little bit before uh, I'm totally within my rights in terms of libertarian theory, whatever your views are. But clearly the point is you ultimately can get them off the property. And so by the same token, that's the way I think legally this would, would manifest itself, that it's not so much or it doesn't need to be that somebody is a convicted killer and therefore we have the right to go take him by force and kidnap him and go put him in a cage. That's not the way I'm picturing it. I'm picturing it as I have the right as a property owner to kick you off my property in any way that I need to based on what your reaction is. I ask, first I ask you to go nicely. If you don't do it, uh, I can then hire some you know, groups to come up and they have body armor on or they have those plastic shields that you know, the police use when there's riots and stuff and they push me off the property because you know the guy has an axe or he could have a gun or whatever, and they get him off, and I, 
but everybody's doing that. So the point is he has nowhere to go. And so you could push him into the ocean and say, I hope you know how to swim. Or, or maybe he's Aquaman or something and have a whale give him a ride. But that's where the, the prisons come into place. So the, I'm viewing them as hotels, right? And they say, this isn't a building that we establish. And what we do here is we're a refuge for outlaws. People, you know, uh, people in society uh, who are being shunned by everybody else. You don't have a place and you're literally going to starve to death because, of course, all the, the stores and stuff say, we don't, you know, you're not allowed to come in here. You can't buy food from us. If you had an apartment, even if the way the contra contracts works, it wasn't actually spelled out beforehand that if you get convicted of being an axe murderer, you can't come into the apartment. Or if you have your, your shack somewhere up on the mountain, you know, you might be able to live, but no one's going to sell you food or the electric companies go, you know, you're going to lose your Wi-Fi. I mean, that right there, with no Wi-Fi, you might as well just turn yourself in, right? <laughs> so you, you see how that works. Okay, so my point is there would be plenty of ways society could deal with people that they need to neutralize and they would get them into these things. And so these so-called prisons would be competing with each other, right? There would be different prisons saying, no, 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 you're an axe murderer. Hey, we love axe murderers. We got plenty of them in here. Come on, talk to these other axe murderers and tell them how, they'll tell you how great it is here. And so the prisons would be competing. So they're, they're not going to have sadistic guards. It's not going to be, you know, and I, I've uh, talked with people that have been uh, in prison for, you know, for drug offenses and things, and the, the stuff that the guards do to them there, but my favorite is this kid told me that, um, so his parents visited him, and of course everyone's real nice and everything, and then when the parents weren't in the room, the guard said that he gave him a broom, and he, he wanted him to sweep up, so the kid's sweeping up, and the guard said to him, there's some sunlight there, you missed a spot. Like, meaning sweep up the sunlight, just to mess with the kid. You, you guys are, don't get what I'm saying, you can't sweep up sunlight, all right? <laughs> There's not physics majors here. Okay, I, I realize what happened. You thought I meant the sunlight is showing that there's dirt. That's not what he was saying. He was saying there's sunlight on the ground. You clearly failed to pick something up off the ground. Keep sweeping just to mess with the kid, all right? But he, the guard was totally nice when his parents were there because he didn't want to get yelled at by the warden. See what I'm saying? So there wouldn't be that kind of crazy stuff where people who are on power trips would be lording it over people who are in there that because that would be bad for business and because the prisoners could just switch because it's like a hotel. The only difference is you can't leave. All right. So it's like the Hotel California. Right. <laughs> so and I'm actually sort of contradicting myself. What I mean, you can leave like you could apply for a formal process to get transferred to a different prison. But my point is you can't just come and go as you please, because why would the community tolerate having this prison there? Why would uh, you know, the, the property developers who are building housing units and stuff around there, why would they agree to someone who comes along and says, I want to buy this land from you and develop a place where we're going to have serial killers stay? Is you'd say, well, you know, to not kill the property value, if I'm the, the developer building this area up, you better convince me that they're not going to escape. All right. And so that you, and you go through things like that. So I think on the, on the one hand, you wouldn't have... Uh, sadistic guards. You also wouldn't have prisoners raping each other and all kinds of disgusting stuff that happens in the real world because, again, these they would be competing with each other. And you say, well, where are they going to get the money? Who's going to fund that? Well, the prisoners would. They could still work from in there if there was various things they could come up with. It would be in the prison's interest to have you be productive. right? They, they don't benefit from you just being a mindless zombie and sitting around. They would want you to be able to be productive so they could charge you for staying in their place. Okay, but you're not going to go somewhere where you hear stories about, oh, yeah, it's, you know, you really got to be careful. There's a bunch of bad stuff that other prisoners do to you in this place. You wouldn't go there. You'd go somewhere else where you know that they set it up and they monitor and make sure the prisoners aren't abusing each other. All right, so that's the basic framework that, uh, for how I picture prisons in this kind of society. Okay, now, so that was the, the, the hard stuff. Now the easy stuff is just military defense. So I think the basic structure would be through insurance companies. All right, so um, you have a big society like New York City, a big, big city, New York City. It's a free society. They're dealing with serial killers and they're dealing with TV thieves the way I just talked about. All right, so there's a basic framework of who owns what. People have made rulings and so there's a, there's a well-established body of law. But people realize, okay, we're kind of sitting ducks here. And because it's an anarcho-capitalist world, it's very productive. It's the wealthiest people on planet Earth. This, this little city here. And so then we notice that, oh, uh, China or something, those, those Chi-Coms, the Chinese communists are gearing up. They're assembling a fleet. 
you know, they're building some aircraft carriers and, they're, and we can kind of get the sense that they're going to come over in about six months. They're going to just totally conquer us. And Guido and his guys in flak jackets and stuff, they're not going to be able to repel aircraft carriers. So what do we do? Um, I think what would happen is there would be a market now for insurance contracts to come along. And so the insurance companies would say to the owners of the skyscrapers and the people who have billions of dollars worth of assets, they would say, look, just like right now, you give us monthly premium payments in case a fire causes $20 million worth of damage to your property, and then we indemnify you, and we look at the situation and determine what's the likelihood of a fire and so forth, and we charge you a premium accordingly. By the same token, we'll charge you a premium and then in the event that your property gets destroyed by enemy bombers or that the troops come in and kind of seize it, and then you as the person who has fled to Ohio or something, you know, you'd no longer get control of your property because these guys came in. Yeah, and our judges would have rulings and say, you know, you, you Chinese communists are bad. You're lawbreakers, but nobody cares because we can't really do anything to them. Um, then we'll send you a check. You know, we the insurance company. And, our, and their headquarters could be elsewhere, too. And they could have assets elsewhere so that they would be able to literally fulfill their, their promises. That it's not that the money they would have to use to pay off the victims or the, you know, would be itself confiscated in the invasion. All right, so they could come up with things like that where you're paying for that. Okay, so then you say, all right, so now we've just transferred it and, and the premiums would be really high, wouldn't they? Because if there's a pretty high chance that these guys are coming and that they're going to take us out, the premiums would be astronomical. Well, no, because now what the insurance companies would do is they say, what can we do to minimize the chance of this happening? And this isn't purely theoretical. This happens like with fire insurance contracts. If you have sprinklers installed or you have a fire extinguisher, that kind of thing, you pay lower premiums. And obviously, and you, know, you guys are familiar with if you're a driver, if you have a bad record, your premiums are higher, even just um, demographically, depending if you're a 19-year-old male, you pay much higher rates than if you're uh, a 40-year-old female in terms of your uh, auto insurance, just because they know statistically you're more likely to have claims. All right, so by the same token, then, they can say, well, we could afford to charge them lower premiums if we took that money, and it's not that we just, like as normal insurance companies do, we don't just invest in bonds and real estate, things like that, to have a big pool of wealth to pay claims. Why don't we spend some of these incoming premium payments on putting mines around the water of our city so that will keep you know, enemy troop ships from come, being able to come in. Or why don't we start buying some submarines? Why don't we maybe start funding some intelligence operations to give us an idea of, are they really coming? You know, We'll put up a satellite or something to monitor them. We'll start paying people to go over there without bringing contracts or anything, but just to start spying on what they're doing over there. Okay, so you start to see how that works. And then even... Uh, things with surface to air missiles and all kinds of stuff, even aircraft. So the point is what so the insurance companies would be the ones I think that would be paying for this stuff. And then how would they structure it? Well, if an actual war starts, I think they would just set bounties and they would come up with, they'd run numbers and it would be a purely economic calculation. And they would say, well, the way our contracts work, uh, you know, there's this skyscraper that we've insured for a billion dollars and we think, you know, if, if some company out there, if you could sink an aircraft carrier, we would pay you $100 million if you could do that. You know, if it got to the point where the Chinese aircraft carrier is literally within striking distance, at that point, that's pretty serious. That billion-dollar liability is looming pretty large, so they'd be willing to pay a lot to take that thing out. And the boy would say, oh, if you could just knock out one single enemy aircraft that's in the air, we'll give you... $20,000, right? Because that on the margin is not going to be the difference between the skyscraper getting captured or getting destroyed, but that's still a significant thing. Whereas if you kill one enemy soldier, that's not that big a deal in the grand scheme of things. We'll give you $1,000 for that, right? So they would come up with numbers, but again, the numbers would not be arbitrary. They would be determined by them assessing what are our liabilities in terms of the property we've insured, and then what what is the relationship between the military accomplishment and minimizing that liability from our point of view? All right, so the, you would have the analog of economic calculation in the military defense arena. So if you understand why Stalin couldn't centrally plan very well and couldn't determine, okay, we've got all this, all this farmland and all this wheat and all these tractors and everything and all these silos, and then we have all these population centers, so how do I grow food to make sure people don't starve? Even if he's trying to help everybody, you, you see how there's the economic calculation issue. By the same token, uh, 
a central planner who says we've got all these tanks and bombers and, and troops, infantry and service-to-air missiles and da-da-da-da-da, and now there's an enemy attack coming, how do I best use these scarce resources to repel that invader? Because all I have in my heart is the interest of my subjects. There's a calculation issue there. It's not obvious how to do it. And should I spend more of my resources trying to sink the aircraft carrier, or should I instead focus on uh, stopping the bombers from hitting you know, daycare centers? It's, and it's not clear. So at least with the insurance approach, you would have objective numbers. Now, you could quibble and say, well, those numbers aren't fair that the daycare can't pay as high as the, the guy running the nightclub or something. And so we had this weird thing where there's more defense given to nightclubs than daycare center. But that would be like, you know, same thing saying that the economic calculation favors rich people over poor people and more food goes into the bellies of rich people than poor people, which is true. But you still see why economic calculation is crucial for producing food. Okay, now what you wouldn't see for sure is this kind of thing. All right, first of all, Guido Hulsman, you know, his PR people would say, sir, you really don't want to have that kind of stuff on, on, your, <laughs> on your brochures. That's just not going to fly. Um, but just think, look, having all these, that would be crazy. Think of how expensive that would be. That would be silly, all right? You would not have huge standing armies, again, not because of the, the general fear of a standing army, which is all true, but just economically, that wouldn't make any sense. Um, I mean, when you see these movies about uh, you know, these, these battles, you know, it was in the Gladiator movie in the beginning, and it was in the, the Chronicles of Narnia movie in the beginning, you know, they have all these things, and, and of course all the Lord of the Rings, and these giant armies on one side, this giant army on the other, and then what do they do? They go, oh, and they just run at each other and just start slaughtering. And that, to me, as an economist, I'm just like, what a waste of labor, oh, you know. And it, <laughs> think of how many commercials you could have written instead of doing that, you know, so. Uh, to me, you know, it's, you could augment it with capital, right? I mean, that's like saying, oh, let's start growing food, and then you just have an army of people who go out and start planting seeds and, you know, start spitting in the ground or something to water them. And he's like, no, you use tools to augment your labor, and you have fewer workers and more, more production. All right, so it's the same thing here that, uh, in practice, I think you'd have much leaner forces who would use a lot more capital equipment. You would not have these giant standing armies. Okay, let me uh, handle some common objections. I'm going to, I guess, go the full time here, and then I'll you know, step aside after your questions afterwards. Okay, so when the mafia become the government? People ask this all the time. The first point is to say, so what if it did? The mafia is so much better in practice than the actual state is, right? Even if that were true, that would be great. Like, I should say, boom, I just win the argument, if that's what your response is, right? That in practice, how much, how much has the mafia taken from you guys in your lives? I don't think they've taken anything from me. So if they have been stealing from me, they're doing a really clever job of hiding it, whereas I'm quite aware of how much the government has taken from me. All right? Um, so, but more seriously, more to the point, think in the United States right now, and I'm just speaking of the U.S. because I know that from personal experience and studying it. I, I can't speak with authority about other areas. But for sure, in the United States, where does organized crime dominate? What sectors? It's those areas that are heavily regulated or outright prohibited by the state. Right? So you don't see the mafia uh, running GRE prep classes. No, you see, <laughs> you see the mafia dealing in gambling, prostitution, uh, loan sharking, which means lending money at interest rates that are illegal for banks to charge. Right? You see the mafia doing that in drugs, of course. Right? So to me, and we have a classic experiment in terms of alcohol prohibition that Al Capone and other organized crime figures were in the alcohol business when it was illegal. Then when they legalized it, it's not that all of a sudden Al Capone and those guys got more powerful. No, they lost that business. And so by the same token, the more you start legalizing stuff, I think the mafia's power would shrink and shrink and shrink. Not that, oh, all of a sudden, if you, le in a sense, legalized everything, meaning totally privatized, now all of a sudden the mafia would run the world. No, it'd be the other way around, that it would have lost all the ability to compete in those areas. Okay, wouldn't warlords take over? Here, uh, because of, we're out of, almost out of time, let me just sit, point you to this essay that I've written. Uh, Walter Block has said something like it's one of the best essays on anarcho-capitalism he's read. So that, that's not me praising myself, that's Walter Block. Anyway. So uh, I would recommend that. And, th and there, what I do, though, is I, I point out the type of thing you would have to assume for warlords to take over, for there to be constant battles in this 
geographical area that we're saying could anarcho-capitalism work f for these people, you're right. We, I can't prove to you that, oh, all we would need is an initial situation where there's no state with these 16 million individuals, and boom, I guarantee you from that point forward, it'll be a nice, peaceful, orderly society, and everyone will settle things through chess matches and not through violence. I can't prove that to you, but what I will say is if anarcho-capitalism wouldn't work in that group area because they have such cultural prejudices, they hate each other so much, they're so quick to settle things with uh, guns, well, then a state would be a bad thing too. In other words, you don't get rid of all those problems by just saying, well, so let's, let's just have one group that's the state. And the classic example here is Somalia. People you know, make jokes that, oh, you guys, you Rothbardians, why don't you move to Somalia? That's to show you how great anarchy is. And the point is, anarchy in Somalia is better than government in Somalia was. Right, that by many objective measures, Somalia, when it had a state, was awful. And then now that it doesn't have a state and has competing warlords and things, it's better than it was. And so it's just doing an apples to apples uh, comparison. And then uh, last thing, because I'm seeing I'm going to get gonged here, when a neighboring state invade, uh, again, we can't prove anything, but what we are seeing is making a relative argument. That given your resources, given the knowledge, the, the warfare experience, whatever, of these group of people, if they have competing agencies that just tap into all their knowledge, it will be a more effective defense than if they appoint one group to monopolize everything and put all their eggs in one basket, so to speak. All right, thanks, everybody.